So today together, we're going to talk about uh, the care and maintenance of violin family instruments. We're going to talk about the basic maintenance for the instrument, then uh, some do's and don'ts to keep the instruments uh, nice and healthy. And uh, in the end, we're going to talk about uh, the top things to keep in mind when dealing with fractional or student instruments. This is something for the teachers that are part of our group. Here, I have a checklist for you from the most to the least regular things we usually do to our violins, violas, or cellos. Don't worry about writing this down. We're going to talk about all of this right now each and everything separately. So, number one, daily wiping of the strings of our instrument and of our bow. I would recommend doing that with a microfiber cloth, but also you can do it with a, a cotton cloth, uh, an old washed many times, lint-free cotton cloth. I would only recommend if you are using a cotton cloth that you don't extend it on the instrument after the use, like many musicians do. They put it on the bridge and the strings and then close the case because the cotton absorbs a lot of moisture and this is not good for your bridge or your strings. If you go with a microfiber cloth, you'll be fine and make a great habit out of it. Wipe your instrument, your bow, your strings, and loosen your, your uh, instrument bow every time you let your instrument down, or if it sounds like too much work, at least before you put it away for the day. I would start cleaning, wiping the instrument from the strings where a lot of rosin sits, under the bridge where everything falls, the bow stick, and then I would take a cleaner part of my cloth or a different clean cloth to do the fingerboard area. So I actually don't bring all the dirt from the rest of the violin where my fingers have to slide. And then for the rest of the body of the violin, just to have it nice and clean. I wouldn't use any liquid solvents on the strings or other means like steel wool. I would only wipe them clean. If you do this every day, you will be amazed of how much, how clean your strings will be for how long. I, I, uh, I it, there was a really interesting study um, from Varshal strings under a microscope, and they tried uh, many different uh, kinds of uh, cleaners for the strings, and then they saw what happened to the strings. And it, you can go and uh, look it up, it's really interesting. Uh, but uh, with, uh, with this, you can understand that only wiping is enough and it's very, very good for your uh, strings. And also your instrument, as you can see afterwards, I wouldn't use at home any liquid solvents either because you don't really know how your varnish is going to react. And also on our violins and our cellos, we have many areas naked of, uh, of varnish or little hits that are not covered uh, in total. So we don't want anything entering these areas or maybe some seams are open because of the weather. You don't want anything entering there because you want it to glue nice and proper in the future. So I would only wipe everything clean with a microfiber cloth. If you do it often enough, it will be enough for your instrument. And something very important, look at your instrument, check it. Every time you, you have it in your arms, look at it all around, see if there are any open seams, any cracks. If you spot any of that, uh, untune your instrument so nothing works until you bring it to the professional. Clean replacement. Here I say violin and viola every four to six months of playing and cello nine to 12 months. This is all approximate because it depends. Are you a performer that you have concerts constantly and you travel a lot, you play a lot, you sweat a lot, you want your instrument to be at 100% at all times? Or maybe a teacher, you don't practice as much maybe anymore. You use your instrument mostly to show your students things. Or if you are a student, and you can't afford like changing your string every four months. I have many students that come to our shop and change the strings once a year. Everything's fine as long as you know why you're doing what you're doing. 
the strings get worn out at different rates, uh, depending on the type, the material used, how much you use it, the quantity and acidity of your sweat, and how good care you take of it every day. Sometimes you can see the wear because uh, there's a, it's a broken string or it's unraveled at some point or it's rusty looking. And sometimes the strings are beautiful. <laughs> you can't see anything, but the sound becomes dull, small. The response is very slow and you know it's time to change your strings. Here, I have 10 steps for you to change your strings at home. First of all, be confident. You're going to break some strings in the process. It's normal. This is how you learn. I would um, put my instrument on a nice uh, clean uh, cloth after I've uh, wiped it clean as usual. And then please change your strings one by one. That way, nothing moves. Before putting on a new string, I would put some graphite on the upper nut groove and on the uh, bridge grooves. That way the strings will slip right on top of those. Be careful when wrapping the string around the peg. We want you to wrap it close to the wall, but not touching the wall. That way your pegs will work, work properly. And also the string or the wall won't get damaged. Here you can see that I'm changing the strings one by one using the graphite every time I before, before I put the new string on. And I'm very careful at how to wrap the string. On number seven, I say upright ball end on fine tuner. This is about mostly about the E string or all four strings if you use fine tuners in all four strings. Be careful. When you put the ball end on the fine tuner, the, the metal of the ball should touch the metal of the fine tuner. No part of the string should touch anything else. That way your string will live for a long time. <laughs> Here you can see the wrapping on the pegs. It's really close to the walls, but not touching the walls at any point, neither here or here. At uh, number eight, I say a trick to stabilize the pitch. So when we put new strings on the first three days, we're going crazy because it untunes constantly. He, I've learned this uh, trick. You take a nice uh, cloth, clean cloth, because your strings are new, a nice clean cloth. You slightly pinch your strings and warm them up, up and down. This will make them untune uh, very fast. Uh, already a tone is down and you keep tuning and doing this, tuning and doing this. And this will save you a day or two of tuning, constantly tuning your instrument. Be careful, don't pinch your strings too hard, just slightly. <laughs> and something very, very important, the most important of all is, you, and you have to learn this, don't be afraid. I know many musicians are, you have to bring your bridge back to its uh, nice place because when you tune all the time, the string grabs the uh, bridge and it makes it lean forward. If you leave it there and uh, play, uh, it will make your uh, bridge warp, uh, lean in the front and warp and change uh, its uh, condition. We don't want that for a bridge. We want it to be nice and straight. So bring it, whenever you see your bridge leaning forward, take it with your fingers. If you saw, I put two fingers in the front, two fingers in the back in case anything happens and I don't want my bridge to follow my instrument. And then with the other two fingers, I pulled it back. And the back of the bridge is right uh, on a 90 degree angle with the instrument. I know it sounds hard and it is hard many times, especially when the strings are old and they are really good grabbing that bridge, but uh, you should try and uh, practice that and learn because it's gonna save you many bridges in the future. If you take your instrument for a string replacement at the professional, 
what they're going to do more than the, what you're going to do at home usually is that they're probably going to check your bridge height as usual, your fingerboard condition. They're going to smooth probably, if needed, the upper nut groove because sometimes it's form changes and you have some buzzes and you don't really know where they come from. Many times it's from the upper nut grooves not being uh, new anymore. So the luthier will fix that and then put the graphite and it will work wonders. They're probably going to fix uh, the strings that are too dug in the grooves of the bridge. This happens a lot and you can't find the A string because it's too dug in. And then they will probably check the pegs and the fine tuners to work properly. Check the placement on the bridge, check the placement of the sound post. If anything is like really weird out of the ordinary, they're gonna tell you about it. They're gonna talk, you're gonna have a nice talk. And then you can decide if you want to have a nice sound setup. Bow hair replacement. Uh, every four to six months or 200 hours of playing. And again, if you are a performer, I have people come here every three months because they have concerts and they want their hair to be perfect every time they play. And I have students that come once a year or even more. The hair gets worn out at different rates, depending again on uh, the type of playing or the sweat. Sometimes you can see it because hairs are broken, many of them, or it's really dark uh, close to the frog or the hair get, get too long. But sometimes they look perfectly clean and you think my hair uh, works wonderful. <laughs> but if it starts being slippery while you play and it doesn't grab the string and you think that you need to put some pressure with your arm, that's a sign that you have to change your, your um, bow hair. Because the hair uh, has some little barbs in there sits the rosin and together they grab the string and uh, put it in vibration. After they get worn, it gets really smooth. So even if you put a lot of rosin, it doesn't have anywhere to stay. It's just gonna fall on your instrument. And that's why you shouldn't clean them, wash them clean or clean them with alcohol. They used to do that many years ago. Adjustment. Usually twice a year, we have problems with our pegs in the summer or the winter. Uh, they may slip or stick depending on the weather and the humidity. Or because of the everyday use after some years, they lose their roundness, them and the hold on the scroll. So what you can do, you do at home is in general, use the peg soap as I think it's called, or a mixture of paraffin, which is simply candle, and some artist soft chalk. But if this is not the problem and it's not touching properly everywhere, the wood on the hall, uh, it's only going to solve the problem for a day or two. And then you're going to have the exact same problem. So if it keeps happening and you have uh, put your strings properly and it's not a matter of string placement on the peg, uh, you should go get them checked because it's probably going to need some touch up from the luthier. Uh, fingerboard planning. Every eight to 18 months, again, depending on how much you sweat, on what your sweat is like, and what is the density of the fingerboard wood of the ebony. You can hear some buzzing all the time, or you play out of tune uh, every time you place your finger. It doesn't really find the same spot underneath. And it really, gets really hard to slide and fly over the fingerboard. That's when you know you have to plan your fingerboard. This example on the left is way overdue. <laughs> Come before that. <laughs> we don't change the fingerboard. We only plan the top of the fingerboard. And you're going to have many uh, fingerboard plannings before you actually have to change your fingerboard. Many, many years. Don't worry about that. Professional cleaning. I say here once a year. Again, it depends a little bit on how much you play and how good care you take of your instrument in everyday basis, if you wipe it clean every, uh, every day or not. The buildup is uh, a little bit of rosin mixed with sweat, uh, respiration, uh, the, all the fatty substances from our hands and our neck here. 
And uh, I say here best performed by a professional, because like we talked before, uh, you never know uh, what you're going to buy, how it's going to react with your varnish. And um, from my point of view, you start, the professional starts from the mildest thing, the mildest thing, and then they go on and on if something doesn't work. And uh, they uh, are very careful to not damage anything on the varnish. And also don't, to not take um, liquids and cleaners and other things inside naked wood, which is very important. So number seven, varnish retouch. Here I have an example. So it depends again on how much you pay and how acid, acidic your sweat is. Uh, there's uh, many areas where you touch and rub and or hurt the instrument. And you can see that uh, here is actually naked wood. Should have come before this happened because some wood is also missing. Usually for uh, violin is all the area when you go up the third position and all the area close to your neck and what touches the shoulder, all the, the edges of the violin because of the bow. And for the cello is usually all the left side, again, where the hand touches and all the back side where your uh, chest touches and all the sides where your feet touch the instrument, where your, your, your legs touch the instrument. Sorry, my feet. Um, sound force replacement. So, oh, sound force replacement, you have, there's a force from the strings on the top of your instrument, many, many kilos. And uh, from underneath, we have the sound force, that is the counter force. Those two together keep the instrument vibrating for the longest time possible. After many years, the little wood called sound force inside from a lot of pressure gets shorter. So it's not gonna have as much force as it used to have. And the vibration is gonna stop much sooner. So when the sound post gets too short, we replace it with a new one, do a sound setup to see exactly where, where is nice with your ear, also with your taste in sound to see where you like it more. And you have a new nice uh, tall sound post to use for many, many years again. The bridge replacement, usually it gets warped a lot before you actually have to change it because of anything else. That's why I said on uh, before about changing your strings to learn, uh, invest some time to learn how to uh, straighten your bridge. It will save you many, many bridges in the future. Uh, careful to not uh, have a lot of moisture close to the bridge. A oh, quick story, one time, one of my clients, we just made a new bridge. She was really happy about it. It was uh, nice and the sound was amazing. And after three weeks, she goes to a concert, she plays. And the next day in the morning, she comes almost crying because her bridge is like this. <laughs> I'm not kidding, like very lean forward. And what happened to my bridge? I can't believe it. And uh, I'm like, did you? have any moisture or water close to the instrument and she was thinking and thinking she said oh my god somebody gave me a rose and for one second because i had to say thank you to everyone i held the rose with the same hand with the hand that i was having my violin on and i saw the droplets going on the bridge and in five minutes <laughs> of course because her bridge was leaning a little bit forward this caused the bridge to actually be like uh, almost 90 degrees forward be very careful. Um, let's go to the next one. Base bar replacement. It will take many years for you to be worried about your base bar. Uh, some signs that your base bar might be changing is that the top has maybe sunk or changed or taking a weird form. Or if you had an accident and hit it somewhere and there's a base bar crack, you will need to put a new base bar on top of that. Or if nothing else is working with your uh, sound and you want to take a turn and see what uh, you can save with the new bass bar. Let's see a little bit about the bow. The thumb leather. 
well, it's there for a purpose and it's to keep your uh, stick from getting worn out. So when it gets worn out, you should change it right away. There's many choices of materials. The grip wire also there to protect the wood, but it also adds weight to your stick. So when you want, need to change it, be careful on what to choose for replacement because it's not only um, a thing of being pretty, it's actually uh, the weight, balances the weight of your bow. If you want more weight, you will use something different than if you want less weight, different material. The bow tip. The bow tip is this white thing you see here, also made from different uh, materials. If this gets broken, let's say you hit your bow somewhere. Uh, if it gets broken, uh, if your tip stays there, your, your, the head of the bow stays there and only the tip has broken, it did its job to protect your bow. And then now you actually have to change that so it can do it again in the future. It's there to protect from the hits, your, the whole head and also from the force from putting the hair in. Some more non-frequent bow repairs are changing the mother of pearl, like this here, the eyelid screw, the thumb groove on the stick, cracks or recumbering on the bow. Now some general do's and don'ts for your instrument. I like to think of our instruments like babies. You will never let your baby in the cold or under the hot sun for a long time, or inside the cold or warm car without air conditioning, or in the trunk, of the car instead of the sitting area. You wouldn't put her to bed without getting it all cleaned up first. And you wouldn't let it on the bed or the couch or the floor unattended. But don't do it with your instrument. The wood is a tricky material. It's hygroscopic and it absorbs and releases moisture all the time. The ideal temperature say we say usually 18 to 25 Celsius or 65 to 75 Fahrenheit and the humidity 40 to 60 degrees. Extreme conditions, or maybe better, extreme change in conditions, this is what bothers us, the changes bother us, may lead to cracks, glue getting undone, the wood warping, the pegs not working correctly, the sound force not doing its job, and the length of the bow hair being too short or too long. This is a five, five minute left for this session. Okay. I, do you want me to go a little bit further and uh, start the questions one minute? Yeah, you still have five minutes left. Perfect. <laughs> so uh, I would uh, recommend here to invest in a good case and a hygrometer. When you change extreme conditions, uh, wait 15 minutes after you open, after you open your case. Uh, invest in an in-case humidity control system and also in a home humidity control system. Uh, never leave the instrument under direct sun, or near the radiator, or the trunk of the car. Never leave your instrument on the bed, couch, or this can happen to your instrument. Your spouse can sit on it, and you end up with no instrument and sometimes no spouse. Never leave your cello on the floor without putting the end thing back in, and don't touch the instruments, and especially don't touch it with wet hands. <laughs> Now, we talked about many things that you have to take care of your instrument, but some of you have uh, student instruments, fractional, cheap instruments. All of this maintenance I talked about probably costs more than the instrument sometimes. What do you do at this point? Some very important things to think about when you're dealing with fractional instruments. Forget what I said before, and let's focus on the really important things. If you are a teacher, you are the only hope to your students to have these things working correctly because they usually don't even know what a luthier is. They come to you, you see their instrument, you play on it to show them stuff and you are uh, their hope to having a correct working instrument sometimes. This is what happens. So number one, right size instrument. Number two, chin rest and shoulder rest for violins and viola and the right chair height for cello. More very important, the right height of the strings at the nut, at the bridge, and the concavity of the fingerboard. You just have to worry about playing and feeling it good to your fingers. The rest is up to you here. Right string spacing, because I've seen it all. Right curve of the bridge for easy bowing. 
soft synthetic strings, I would say better for the kids because really soft on the touch and the sound is much rounder. Look at the bow, light and uh, straight. If it's not, don't rehair it or recamber it because it's too cheap. Buy a new but nice bow. Same instrument, neck. Check the neck if it's okay. Check the instrument that is not too heavy for the kid to have. Here I have a guide for you. See if the size is right. So three pictures. Uh, when the student expands their arm, it has to uh, get easily around the scroll, like in the second photo. Here is too small and here is too big. Also, when they are in plain position, their arm has to have a 90 degree angle right here, not smaller and not bigger. And when placing all four fingers on the right pitch, they should be relaxed and round. You see here on the fourth photo that she put the fourth finger on the right uh, note. It's really, really far away. She can reach it. Also, right shoulder is in rest, like we talked about. The neck has to be all nice and straight and the shoulders very balanced, not leaning inside or too high, like in this photo. And the right side shallow. You, after you put this nice curve on around the knee, the top has to be on the player's chest. The peg of the C has to be right behind the ear, not too small or not too big. So today we talk about what you have to do to all your professional instruments because they're your financial investment and you have to great, take great care of them. But also if you are a student and you have a student instrument, it's a huge time investment and they're the future the, of, our, of the music. So you have to take great care of many important things, at least, even if they are cheaper instruments. This was me. And if you have any questions, I don't know if we have time. <laughs> if we don't have time, you can also email them to me. Wow, that was so clear and concise and amazing. Thank you, Thank you. for sharing. Thank you so much, Jimmy. We are right on time. Um, uh, we are just going to wrap this up unless I see any questions being raised. Um, what, um, I did see a, um, something that was talked about in the chat. Uh, I think Bridget asked, is there a specific lotion that uh, players should maybe avoid? Um, I, I, I mentioned the sparkly ones, but do you have any Thoughts? They are very hard to take out when it's cleaning. <laughs> Please do for our sake. Listen, uh, it's your life. I mean, um, you're a musician, but you're also a human. Try to do what makes you happy and everything else we're going to try and uh, uh, make it right. At least do uh, what we talked about, the, the, the big things like wipe your instrument clean, even if you put lotion or other things, if you do wipe it clean every time, I don't think there will be any problem anywhere. If you see naked wood, take it to the luthier, it has to be covered. That's the, the varnish is what why the instruments are here after 500 years of use. I mean, they are simple things, always the simplest things, but uh, they're uh, sometimes hard to, to do for us when uh, our, our job is hard and we have to run from one concert to the other. I know, uh, but try your best. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eris.